Well, good morning. Let me, let me say first, let me get you all to, to give a, a big round of applause to Matt and to the entire Road Family Ministry team. That's, the, that's the, the primary reason I'm glad that he asks me to do this every year is so that I can tell you what an amazing job the, the Road Family Ministry team does. This conference is, is incredible, and the way that they put it together is incredible, and the fact that you are here, you are incredible, and I never, I never want to get on this stage without telling people I love you, and, and I, I know that as parents... Uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever your role in the family, uh, you need to hear that because you don't hear it enough from your kids, I'm sure. Uh, but I love you, and I love you for your concern for your family, your love for your family, your, your being here on a Saturday with everything that you have going on in your life. It's, it's not easy, is it? Every, every year that we do the, the conference, I feel, I feel less adequate uh, to be able to stand up here. I always tell people that I used to be an expert on parenting until I had kids, and that changed, that changed everything. And every year that goes by, I, I feel less and less and less like an expert. Although, although I will say that on the way here this morning, uh, the boys were talking about, I've got a 14-year-old and 11-year-old, both middle schoolers, and they were talking about what's dad preaching about today. And my oldest said to my youngest, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about arguing with your kids. I wouldn't exactly put it that way, but he said he's talking about arguing with your kids. And the phrase he used to describe it was, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? That's kind of ironic. In fact, I, I told Matt, I think we could, with the title, What If I Disagree With My Kids, we could just leave off the first two words uh, off the title. I disagree with my kids, period, end of discussion. I, I disagree with them. Um, and, and in fact, I told my 14-year-old, I said, I said, can I, I always ask, I try to always ask if I can use them as an example before I do so. And so I said, could I, could I use some of the things that we've disagreed about, not argued, but disagreed about? Could I use some of that for my, my talk this Saturday? And he said, better than that, I will come back from whatever the middle schoolers are doing and I'll stand on stage with you and I'll disagree about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> on the way here this morning, he said, I could disagree about capuchin monkeys. He said capuchin monkeys. I don't know where he got, I said, I don't have a position on capuchin monkeys, so I can't really disagree. But that's the thing with my 14 year old is he could, he could disagree whether he has a position or not. I, I think if you could get paid for arguing and disagreeing, he would make a fortune. So I'm not sure if professional baseball doesn't work out for him, which is his goal, uh, a lawyer may be something, something where he gets paid uh, to disagree with people. But so I, I, I tell you all that to say I, I feel incredibly inadequate anytime I'm talking about parenting because I'm certainly not, I'm not an expert and I don't have the answers. I feel like I, the older I get, the more experience I have. It's more like I'm starting to discover the questions rather than have the answers. But, but I, I do have a lot of experience disagreeing with, with my kids. And so that, that's the only area where there might be some expertise here. Uh, but, but I want to I approach this talking about two different sorts of sides of this. One, why do we disagree with our kids? Because I'm going to assume that you probably have an equal amount of experience arguing with your, not arguing, disagreeing with your kids. Um, but why, why do we have disagreements with them, number one? And then number two, how to disagree well. How to disagree well. I, I'm not interested in eliminating disagreements. I'm not even interested in minimizing disagreements. I'm okay with disagreements. But how do we do it well? How do we disagree with our kids well? How do we do that wisely? So first of all is why, why do we disagree with our kids? And so I was thinking through that, and I think there's at least four. There's probably lots of them. Some may just be because they're stubborn or because I'm stubborn. But, but why do we disagree with our kids? Sometimes we disagree with them because they're wrong, right? Sometimes we disagree with our kids because they're wrong. And... And I want to have a family where it's okay for me to tell my children when I think they're wrong. I think we're moving into an era that makes me kind of nervous because we seem to be living in a culture, in an era where parents don't think they have or feel like they have permission to tell their children, I believe 
you are wrong. It's okay. It's okay to tell your children, I believe you are wrong. I want to have a household where I can tell my children, I think you're wrong. The position that you're holding, the thoughts that you're saying, what you believe about this is wrong. It doesn't match up with. It is not aligned with what is true and what is right. And so I think it's okay as parents if we tell our children sometimes that they are wrong. But but the other side of that coin is that sometimes we disagree with our kids because we are wrong. <laughs> we are wrong. And sometimes there's a disagreement because we are wrong. And just like I want to have a family and a household where I can tell my kids, I think you're wrong, I also want to have a household where it's okay for them to tell me, Dad, I think you're wrong. And I'll say, I'm succeeding at that. I, I'm doing really great because they have no problem telling me that they think that I'm wrong. And, and I'm okay with that because guess what? Sometimes I am wrong. And sometimes they have an insight that nobody else has. They have a fresh perspective that they can bring to things. And sometimes I need to be open to the idea that I'm wrong and, and maybe they're the one who respectfully, kindly is going to tell me that I'm wrong being wrong. The third possibility is that we're both wrong. Sometimes we don't even entertain that possibility, but it's true. Sometimes we're disagreeing about things because both of us are wrong. We're, we're both over here holding two different positions, and the truth is somewhere over there, and we're not lined up with the truth, but we're disagreeing with each other. Sometimes we need to have the, the open-mindedness to realize maybe we can both admit that we're mistaken. Maybe we can both admit that we are wrong. And I want to have a family, I want to have a household where we're all able to admit when we're wrong. And the fourth possibility, and this is probably where a lot of disagreements land, is that there are no right or wrong answers on this particular issue. That's not to say that there are no rights and wrongs, period. It doesn't mean that everything is relative, everything is subjective, that's not true. There are those who would want us to think that everything is sort of relative and everything is subjective. That's not true, but, but there are a lot of things that are relative and subjective. It's okay to have a difference of opinion. And my kids and I, we have all kinds of differences of opinion, like clothing, for instance. I mean, everything that I thought I knew, like the one rule, like don't wear black socks, don't wear socks at all with sandals. They're doing that, I don't get it. I, I, if you're wearing Crocs, I'm sorry, but I didn't, I like, I thought those were gone. I, I didn't think we would see the Croc thing again. They're back, they're huge, they're expensive, they want to wear them all the time. Mullets are back, and I mean, there's just all kinds of, fanny packs are back. I mean, there's all kinds of things, and they're like, Dad, this is cool, and I'm like, okay, if you say it's cool, but we, we, we're going to disagree on those things, and that's okay. And, and I want to live in a house. I want to have a family where I can have my opinions about things and where they can have their opinions about things and where we can talk about it, we can discuss it, we can disagree with one another, we can tease each other, we can laugh about it, but we can both have different opinions on things that our opinion matters. But then there are other things that are not matters of opinion. There are things that are right. There are things that are wrong. And whether we're talking about things that are right or wrong or just opinion, whether it's my kids that are wrong or I'm wrong or we're both wrong or neither one of us is wrong, I want us to be able to disagree wisely. I want to be able to disagree wisely. So here's the big question today. What does it look like to disagree with wisdom? Wouldn't that be nice to disagree with wisdom? Again, I'm not interested in getting rid of disagreements. Disagreements are good. It's good. I think it is good. I think it is healthy. I think it is right when we can disagree with each other if we can disagree with wisdom. But, but this disagreeing with wisdom it begins, the wisdom begins long before the disagreement begins, right? We have to cultivate wisdom now for the next disagreement later. 
We have to be working on being wise right now, cultivating wisdom, because if we're going to disagree with wisdom, then that means in our family, if we're going to disagree with our kids specifically in wisdom and with wisdom, then we have to work on being wise people ourselves as parents. We have to be wise. We have to cultivate wisdom in ourselves But then we also have to model wisdom for our kids. Show them what wisdom looks like. Show them what it looks like. Even even when it's not your disagreement with them specifically, it's just how you're living your life. Show them, model for them what wisdom looks like. And then we also have to explicitly teach them what wisdom looks like. What does it look like to be wise people? And then And then insist that if we're going to disagree with each other, and chances are you've got disagreements in your house, and I've got disagreements in in my house, and I don't want to get rid of those, but I do want to insist on the ground rules. That if we're going to disagree with each other, then we have to disagree wisely. We have to disagree with wisdom. And again, that begins, the work of that begins long before the disagreement begins. This isn't something that we do in the moment. The the hard work that it takes to disagree well, to disagree with wisdom, begins long before the disagreement begins. So I want to look at James chapter 3 and just try to glean some wisdom for how we disagree with our our kids. James 3 verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him, what's the word? Show, show his works in the meekness of of wisdom. That's James. James is all about action. Don't just talk about it. Show me. Talk is cheap, right? Talk is cheap. Don't tell me that you're wise. Show me your wisdom. Don't tell me you have faith. Show me your faith. Don't tell me you have love. Show me your love. Show your wisdom in what you do, in your good conduct. Don't don't just tell your kids you're wise. Don't just talk about wisdom. Show them what wisdom looks like through your good conduct. And we, we know this, don't we? We know that nothing destroys credibility like hypocrisy. Nothing destroys our credibility like hypocrisy. And that's true in every relationship, but in no relationship is it more true than when you're dealing with your kids. Because they see you on Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. They see you when you're tired. They see you when you're well-rested. They see you when you're hangry. Hangry. Isn't that a good word? I mean, I wish we'd had that word 20 years ago. I love that word. Hangry, right? You're a little bit hungry. You're a little bit grumpy. You're hangry. And they, they know what you're like when you're hangry. They see you. They see your conduct. And and if we're going to disagree in wisdom, if I'm going to disagree in wisdom with my 14-year-old or my 11-year-old on Friday, then they need to have seen my good conduct a month prior and two months prior and a year prior. Not not my perfection, because I'm not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect, perfect. We're not going to have perfect conduct, but we need to have good conduct. They need to see that. They need to see that my mom, my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunt, my uncle, they really believe this stuff. And they're really trying to live this way. Because if we want our kids to just totally disregard everything we say, all we have to do is be hypocrites. Just say one thing and do another. But if we really want them to listen to what we have to say, to take our viewpoint seriously when we disagree with them, when we say, son, I think you're wrong. Sweetheart, I think you're wrong on this. If we want them to take that seriously, then we have to live consistently throughout the week because nothing destroys credibility like hypocrisy. But I love that James says, show his works in the what of wisdom? Meekness. Meekness of wisdom. I love that word, meekness. It's defined as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. 
That's good, isn't it? Meekness is the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Meekness, a lot of times, has to do with what you do when you're wounded, what you do when you're hurt, how you defend yourself, or how you don't defend yourself. And if we're going to disagree with our kids in wisdom, then we have to remember not to make it about ourselves. And that's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard when we feel like you're, you're, you're taking a different path here. And, and the way you're going, it's just really dumb. What are you doing? Don't do that. That's silly. Why are you making that choice? Why are you going down that path? Why are you going down that road? It's really easy to take it personally. Or when they say to us, Dad, Mom, I disagree with you. I think you're wrong. It's really easy to get defensive and to make it about ourselves. But we would do well to show our good works, our good conduct in the meekness of wisdom. Don't make it about yourself. Then he says in verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Now, now I'm not saying that that in your relationship with your kids, you're going to have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Maybe not. But I'll, I'll tell you from my own personal life, Most of the times that I'm short with my kids and that I don't disagree in wisdom with them, most of the time where I get upset and angry and I've got a short temper, it's not because of them. It's because I'm not getting what I want somewhere else in the world. I'm not getting what I want somewhere else in life. My selfishness, my ambition, my jealousy that someone else is getting what I think I deserve when somebody isn't treating me the way that I think that I deserve, that bitterness, that selfish ambition that exists in my heart, I carry that over into my disagreements with my family. And and that's when there is disorder in every vile practice. If we're going to disagree in wisdom with our kids, then it starts with getting these kinds of things out of our own hearts and out of our own minds. But it also is about doing the same and helping our kids do the same themselves. That if they're going to disagree with us in wisdom, we have to help them with this. Because we live in a culture that feeds, that feeds selfish ambition. We live in a culture that feeds bitter jealousy. We live in a hyper-individualistic culture that tells these kids, don't let your parents get in your way. Go do whatever you want. Go grab whatever you want. Go have whatever experience you want to have. And then when you step in and try to disagree in wisdom, their, their hearts and minds are saying, you're getting in my way. You're keeping me from getting what I want. And so both for ourselves and for our kids, we have to deal with this, with bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, which means that we have to teach, but but more so, we have to model selfless humility. How do you act when other people are getting what you want? How do you act when you can't chase your dreams? How do you act when you have to sacrifice? How do you act when you have to practice self-denial? Because you're modeling for them what that looks like. And that will influence how you disagree. If they feel like you always get what you want and you don't stop until you get what you want, then what do you think they're going to do when they want to get what they want? But if we model and teach for them that following Jesus means we take up our cross, It means self-denial, it means humility, it means meekness. Then hopefully that we can make those characteristics and qualities part of the way we disagree in our home. Look at verse 17. He contrasts the wisdom from below with the wisdom from above, and he says, the wisdom from above, and then he's going to describe that, but just stop there for a second. The wisdom from where? Above. The wisdom from where? Above. Not, not the wisdom from within. 
not the wisdom from out there. Because worldly wisdom, and again, culturally, we're, we're told all the time, if you want to be wise, look inside yourself. Look inside yourself. Find the answers in your heart. Find the answers in your mind. Be who you want to be. But Scripture presents us with a, a counter-narrative that says wisdom, real wisdom, true wisdom isn't from within. It, true wisdom isn't even out there. True wisdom is up there. And James begins this letter by telling them, if you lack wisdom, look inside your heart. Is that what he says? If you lack wisdom, go sit on a mountaintop and contemplate the world. If, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Ask God. He gives generously. He would love to give you wisdom. God is the one who bestows wisdom upon us. We have, to, we have to model this and teach this to our kids. We have to help them realize that we get it. I am foolish. I'm foolish. I don't, I don't know which way is up. I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's good. I don't know what's bad. Apart from God, I wouldn't know anything. Apart from God, I don't even know what I want. Wisdom isn't in me. Wisdom is in him. Do, do our kids hear us praying like that? Do they hear us confessing our foolishness to our Father and begging, desperately begging God to give us wisdom? Do they see us saturating our mind and our heart with Scripture because we recognize how foolish and ignorant we are? Or do they see us saying, I've got all the answers. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I've got experience. I've got, I've got all of these things I've been through. Or do they see us saying, guys, I'm trying to figure this out too. And I need wisdom from above. He says the wisdom from above is first pure. Is first pure. Again, purity is the opposite of hypocrisy. If we live one way this day and a completely different way the next day, do you think they're going to take us seriously when we disagree with them? When we try to dissuade them from a certain path? If, we, if we're going to be taken seriously by our kids or by anybody, then our wisdom has to be, and if it's from above, it will be pure. He says it's first pure, then peaceable. Peaceable. And so much of what James has to say here is about being peacemakers. Wisdom isn't about having a long gray beard. Wisdom isn't about having a lot of pithy statements. And we, we just did the, the cahoot on on uh, um, sitcoms, family sitcoms. And, and, you know, you think back to some of the older sitcoms, the newer sitcoms, the dads are always kind of foolish, but the older sitcoms, they were all always so wise. And every time the kid came, they had a little pithy, pithy thing to say to the kids, leave it to Beaver. Ward always had all kinds of wise things to say. And sometimes we think that we're not being wise because we don't have a pithy statement. Wisdom from above is peaceable. James says, you want, you want to be wise? You want, you want people to see your wisdom? Then be peacemakers. Be peaceable. See, this is the difference between disagreeing with our family and arguing or fighting with our family, especially fighting. I, I think disagreeing is good. I think fighting is bad. What's the goal in fighting? Hurting somebody. When you're fighting somebody, you're trying to hurt them. You're trying to hurt them more than they hurt you. And sometimes we do that in family. And that's not wise. That's not what wisdom looks like. So yes, you, you think that the path that they're choosing is, is foolish and wrong and, and is not aligned with God. And you think that, that they're making a mess out of their life. I get it. But don't try to hurt them. Don't try to hurt them. Don't think that if you can push them down enough, if you can intimidate them enough, then you can force them to go in the right way. Wisdom from above is peaceable. And then it is gentle. Gentle is defined as not insisting on every right or letter of law or custom. It is yielding, gentle, kind, courteous, tolerant. If we're going to practice godly wisdom then it has to be 
gentle. We can disagree with each other, but we have to disagree gently. Another term for this is picking your battles. Not everything is worth disagreeing over. Not everything even has to be discussed. Sometimes you can do this. Okay, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not crazy about the whole phrase, you do you, but sometimes that's perfectly fitting, right? You do you, and you want your white Crocs? Go for it, bud. You know, you do you. I'm not going to wear them, but you do you. That's fine. Not everything, not everything is something that you have to throw down over. We, we have to be able to discern is this something on which I yield? Or is this something on which I stand my ground? That's discernment. That's what wisdom looks like. Wisdom looks like very seriously contemplating what sort of issue is this? Why are we disagreeing over this? Is this a big deal? Is this something that you're going to learn on your own? Sometimes you're going to learn the hard way and I should just let you learn on your own? Or is this something I need to say something about? Is this something I need to stand my ground on or is this something I could just say, you do you, go see how that works out? We have to be able to be gentle, knowing when to yield and knowing when to stand firm. Then he says, open to reason. Here's a good one, open to reason. Because again, sometimes we disagree because we're wrong. Sometimes when I have a disagreement with my kids, it's because I'm wrong. And they're telling me that I'm wrong. But often, I don't want to hear it. But godly wisdom, wisdom from above, is open to reason. Whether you're right or you're wrong, whether you think you might be wrong or you know for a fact that you're not wrong, you still have to demonstrate that you are open to reason. Are you capable of changing your mind? If we want our kids to be open-minded, if we want them to be open to reason, then we have to demonstrate what does that look like, which means sometimes we have to be convincible. Say, show me. If this is right, if this is the right way, then, then show me how that's right. And, and sometimes we have to yield and say, you know what? I think you might be right on that. I was wrong. Let's, let's go. Let's do what you suggested. Not only with our kids, but they have to see that us do that with other people being open to reason, that we're willing to change our minds. Several times today, we've already talked about James 1, 19 and 20, how James says that we have to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. We have to receive the word with meekness. Guess what? Sometimes the person giving you the word of God that is able to save your soul is your kid. On more than one occasion, I've seen kids bring their parents back to the kingdom of God. Sometimes very small children. Sometimes by asking very just mundane questions and sometimes asking very pointed questions. Why don't you go to church, Dad? Why don't you go to church with us anymore? And those questions, because the parents were open to reason, changed their life forever. Your kids have a deep spiritual insight. Sometimes the younger they are, the more insight they have. And the teenagers, I don't know. But, you know, when they're, <laughs> ta when they're, you know, five, six, I mean, it's amazing. They're little theologians. It's phenomenal. Are you open to reason? Are you willing to receive the truth even from your children? Open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy means compassion. Tim did a phenomenal job in here talking about having conviction and compassion. Our kids have to see that in us, demonstrated towards other people with whom we disagree and demonstrated towards them full of mercy and good fruits. Then he says, impartial. We have to show our kids that we are impartial. If we're always making statements like, well, you're too young, you wouldn't understand, does that demonstrate impartiality? Are we surprised when we tell our kids over and over again, you're too young, young people don't get it, young people don't understand, young people are foolish. If we tell them that, are we surprised when they say, Dad, you're too old, you just don't get it. If we want them to be impartial and to receive truth from any source, 
That if something is true, that we're going to receive it. If something is true, we want it. Regardless of the person that delivers it to us, then we have to demonstrate and teach and model impartiality. That we don't make assumptions about people because of how they look. We don't make assumptions about people because of how they dress. We don't make assumptions about people because of their tattoos or their piercings. We don't make assumptions about people because of where they come from or the language that they speak. We don't make assumptions about people because of their age. We don't make assumptions about people because they're different than us and assume that if someone doesn't look like us and make the same choices as us and go to the same places and speak the same language, then they have nothing to offer us. If those are the sorts of partial, biased, prejudiced types of decisions that we're demonstrating and teaching to our kids, then we can't be surprised when they show that same type of bias and prejudice and partiality when they're talking about our opinions and our views and our truth that we're trying to share with them. The wisdom from above is sincere. Sincere. Our kids should never have to ask or never have to wonder, are you telling me the truth? Are you being genuine? Are you sincere? Which one of the easiest ways and most important ways of eliminating that question from our house might be sarcasm. Sarcasm is a way of biting at each other through statements that are insincere. Our children shouldn't have to question our sincerity. Verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Again, the harvest comes after the planting, doesn't it? Sometimes much, 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 much later. We plant the seed now and the harvest comes later. We have to do the hard work now of being wise and teaching wisdom and modeling wisdom and helping our children to develop and cultivate wisdom themselves. We have to do this hard work now so that later when we have a disagreement, and maybe it will be a profound disagreement, maybe it will be a life changing, life-altering disagreement so that that goes as well as it possibly could later. We have to do the hard work now. Here's the way the message puts it. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. The hard work happens now, and the benefit happens later. Or another way to put it is the outcome of your next disagreement is being determined now. Think about that for a second. The outcome of your next disagreement is being determined now. That doesn't mean that if you do everything right now, as if if you could do everything right right now, It doesn't mean that if you do everything right, then later on they'll always agree with you. That's not what it means. It means that it's going to go as well as it possibly can. We can disagree with wisdom, but that hard work happens now. What we're doing now determines and helps determine what will happen later. The outcome of my next disagreement with my boys is determined by what I'm doing now. Am I cultivating wisdom from above? Am I asking for wisdom from above? Am I living with wisdom from above? Am I demonstrating wisdom from above? And am I teaching them to do the same? Is this the expectation that yes, we're gonna disagree, we're gonna disagree, but we're gonna disagree with wisdom from above? above. The outcome of the next disagreement is being determined right now. Thank you, church.